Welcome, good afternoon. Um, this is the opening weekend programming at PhotoCatcom this year. We're really um, excited to kickstart the festival. It's been months of um, prep work, and so it's, uh, it's good to see it all up and happening. Um, we will be starting today with uh, two talks uh, every day, one now um, with Pema and Augustea. I will introduce both of them to you in a second. Um, and then we have more programming tomorrow, um, same time, starting at 4 p.m. and then at 5.30. Um, and then, of course, our exhibitions are up. So if you haven't had a chance to walk around Patton and see some of them, then after the talks tonight, um, we invite you. It's, it's, a, it's a really nice viewing experience um, at night, especially with all the lights on. Um, and of course, we have maps and uh, schedules out and about. So if you don't have a copy, you're welcome to pick um, one up. Um, and <coughs> the the way we've structured it this year is that um, the first uh, half of the print exhibition is open today, and then uh, the second half open on the 26th, which is after uh, nothing. So um, we hope you can join uh, us at all of the programming. I hope you can join us uh, uh, to see some of the exhibitions. I know you're leaving soon. But it's really exciting to have you in town. Um, so I'd like to formally introduce Pema to you. Um, Pema has worked uh, as a cultural consultant and in the development sector for um, a number of years now. Uh, she has a background in history and in, in conflict studies and, uh, and has been, actually worked, uh, has been based out of Kathmandu for several years. Uh, with the Asia Foundation, um, but Pema has also worked for organizations like Human Rights Watch and the Crisis Group, um, uh, based out of various cities around the world. And so, I think with this background, she now has arrived at this very interesting uh, <laughs> adventure. I'm sure it is. Uh, you will tell us more about it. Uh, but she set up this um, initiative uh, in Sikkim called Project Dentom. And uh, she's been um, archiving uh, the um, Sikkim Palace archives. And this has been uh, made possible by a very important grant that she's received from the British Library's um, Endangered Archives program. And so we're really excited to see this work. Um, I have personally been sort of just following it online and you know, on Instagram and Facebook and, and, and you know, it's possible to do that a little bit from a distance, but then when we realized that she was actually in town, uh, we made a request and uh, extended her stay by a couple of days. So very, very um, pleased to be actually seeing some of this work and hearing about it and, and the process. And so Pema will present initially, and then um, Pema will, um, we will invite our dear friend, um, Augustia Tapa, uh, to join them up on stage and, and they will have a conversation. <laughs> Augustia Tapa, for those of you who haven't met her around the festival, has uh, been in Kathmandu uh, for the last five months with us um, as a research fellow uh, with the Feminist Memory Project. Uh, Augustia has a PhD from JNU, uh, the School of Arts and Aesthetics, and um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your research later when you're up there. Um, but very much working with visual archives as well. And now as an independent uh, researcher, um, she will continue, I'm sure, this work. And we are really hoping uh, that in the next couple of months, we will be able to extend the Feminist Memory Project uh, for its sort of next life and invite Augustia back, hopefully, uh, to join us. Because it's been a really, I think, uh, a valuable um, uh, learning experience for us as well, you know, uh, to, to, to be able to work with um, researchers, people who are professionally trained researchers, um, to expand the, the archive that we've been building for, for the last seven, eight years. So welcome to you both, Pema and Garcia. And uh, I won't uh, sort of butt in in between, so whenever you're done, perhaps you could invite Garcia. 
And, and then at the end, we will break for a, a short question and answer. So over to you. Thank you, Nayantara. Um, just to echo her sentiments, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've similarly been following the photo circle work and photo Kathmandu over the last couple of years. So I'm really glad this has worked out and at a time where we're able to give a little bit of air time to our project in Sikkim. Um, I think if I were to ask you what you think of when you hear of the words of archive and archiving, <coughs> I'm not sure many of you would think of a place of inspiration or much creativity. I mean, I think it has the connotation oftentimes of a dim, musty place filled with shelves, filing cabinets, historical documents that are pretty static and maybe irrelevant to life today. And oftentimes that is the case, and unfortunately today I will be talking about the archive, but um, I want to approach it in a way where we can talk about the archive as a repository for so much potential forward movement, culturally, socially, and creatively. The archive can actually be a very active and discursive system, and one that has really already engaged the attention of so many contemporary artists today, um, and in recent years, over the decades. So this nexus of photography, archive, and memory is one that's very clearly and intimately connected, but one that I just want to explore a little further today. Um, I think the visual culture that we live in nowadays, um, the simplest way to start changing one's perspective of the archive as a boring place is to start thinking of it as analogous to that of a photograph. So both are often held up as, um, sorry, as documentary records of a past event that is indisputable in its existence. Both archiving and photography as an act of preservation can be seen as a resolution to bear witness and to remember. And if the archive is seen as a repository of reported memories committed to paper for future reference or for posterity, photography is literally the machine that industrializes visual memory. And so there emerges a common perception of both the photograph and the archive as bearers of some sort of objective authority. There's that old saying, the camera never lies, right? Well, we used to think of the photograph as recorders of reality. Now we know they largely invent reality, whether in the shooting, the editing, the development, or the placement. At one stage or another, photographs are usually manipulated, which means we as the viewer are also manipulated. And we're so used to it, we don't even see it anymore. It's just a fact of life. And this means that the images that we're viewing are often more subjective than we like to admit. And with archives, much like a photograph, we have no way of knowing what lies outside the frame. Um, we don't know what was held in natural memory and never committed to paper. We don't know what was left out, cropped, if you will. We don't know what was forgotten, what was destroyed. Um, and then definitely the perspective, the lens through which end viewers are viewing both the image and the document, is also highly subjective. It runs a spectrum from academically objective to profoundly personal. Um, and what all this means is that the ways in which contemporary users become reacquainted with images and documents of their ancestors, and the ways in which those images and those biographies become resutured into living memory today can be incredibly varied. It's driven oftentimes by a combination of cultural reappropriation, by contemporary um, social commentary, as well as um, a psychological need to, in a way that builds self-preservation in a search for identity. Um, and before we get going, I just want to say that um, we should also remember that archives and, and archiving, however much of a buzzword it seems nowadays, is nothing new. Um, one of art's most significant kind of developments in the recent time, let's say since the 1960s, has been a turn to the archive. The nexus of images, objects, documents, and traces through which we recall and revisit individual and shared memories and histories. It's, the archive is already central in visual culture, and this started way back with Andy Warhol, who I'm sure all of you are familiar with. He, culled his images straight from the public record, 
oftentimes from Life magazine, and he made them public in a new way as an art form. So this is something that, particularly for those of you that are photographers or artists out there, I want you to just think about um, how you can approach the archive as a source of creativity. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we understand as the value of the archive and how we balance that with the cultural significance of memory. Over the last couple of years, as Nayantara noted, I've been working with an independently held archive in Sikkim, which is a state of India on the eastern border of Nepal. The British Library's Endangered Archives Program in London is funded by Arcadia, and they generously gave a one-year grant to train a team of five young Sikkimis to catalog, digitize, and archive its documentary collection. This turned out to be a little over 100,000 documents. So maybe unsurprisingly, in that one year, we didn't also get time to work on the photo collection, but being a photo festival, I will start sharing some of those photographs with you. They just hadn't been archived or digitized yet. Um, and I think there's probably a wide spectrum of knowledge on Sikkim in the room today, so I'm gonna run over a little bit of the basics of Sikkim, a little bit of its history before we get to the actual project. Um, as you can see, we're neatly tucked at the intersection of Nepal and Bhutan, the TAR and India. Um, Kanchenzunga, the world's third highest mountain, rises from our western glaciers and Nepal's eastern glaciers. This is Gangtok, where about a third of our 600,000 population now lives. There's always a new trend. And at night, our young people like going out and letting go, much like they do everywhere else in the world. But about 70% of Sikkim's towns and villages look more like this. And daily life looks something like this, or like this in Zonggu in North Sikkim, which isn't so different to what life looked like in the 1960s, or even in the 1970s. But this is not to say that Sikkim, along with the rest of the world, hasn't experienced vast and rapid changes, especially since our controversial integration with India in 1975. The internet, of course, has done wonders to the sharing of knowledge and the bridging of gaps, both cultural and societal. And yet in India, in the more mainstream communities at the center of society, exoticism often serves to distort and manipulate the cultural heritage and history of those on its national peripheries. Um, you see this across India, and I think Sikkim, for example, is subsumed within the discourse of India's larger northeast despite the fact that Nagas and Khasis have very little in common with each other, let alone with Bhutias and Limbus and Lepchas. And at the same time, Sikkimis are concerned that our traditions and our culture and our identity are in danger of being lost in a tirade of misinformation and inaccuracies and modern day materialistic pop culture that has really captured the aspirations of our youth. Uh, the chronic commodification of our cultural heritage for the sake of tourism has created a veneer of preservation, which upon further examination often appears superficial and ultimately is unsustainable for sale at the Dili Hut. There's a saying that the archivist is basically a historical materialist, someone who aims to wrest history from conformism when it's on the verge of its own destruction. And so it's worth noting that while the predominant archive of a place is usually institutionally held and reflective of existing hierarchical power structures, the National Archive on India holds very little publicly available material on Sikkim, at least that it cares to declassify. Um, and, and there's also no public library in Sikkim, nor is there a public or a private museum yet, although I think they're working on it and no local history is taught in any school. So in fact, the history of Sikkim and much of the region has really only been told using British imperial sources. And I think we've all reached this kind of point where we wish the British officers could have been a little more nuanced or a little more insightful in the ways they approached indigenous populations. So to have our whole history told from that perspective is quite uncomfortable nowadays. Um, additionally, the Archaeological Survey of India, so-called experts in conservation, restores 
are the murals of our oldest monastery, like this. Um, this was damaged in the 2011 earthquake. So many people, particularly in West Sikkim, where this monastery is, feel that this is another whitewashing of our unique cultural identity. And you all should feel very lucky that you have Kathmandu Valley Preservation Trust here, rather than ASI looking after Bhattam Um So in Sikkim, this, you know, it's within this context of the absence of archive that I really want to, that our project took place. And nowadays, academic discussions and popular discussions concerning historical aspects of Sikkim's past suffer from an extreme paucity of sources. Um, and the vacuum is exacerbated by the sensitive political situation in Sikkim after 1975 and leads to arguments that are, that are rooted not in facts, but in emotion. And this leads to increasingly vitriolic inter-ethnic tensions that are stirred by money and power and politics. And as a result, Sikkim's in-depth study is restricted and the balanced understanding of the region is almost impossible. So we can avoid talking about history or culture or society, but it's this same historical vacuum that denies our communities a sense of identity, as well as the facility of cultural preservation in a rapidly homogenizing India. And ultimately does our current generation an immense disservice. So to quickly run through our history, our documented history really only starts in the 1600s with the events leading up to the coronation of Punsok Namgyal as the first Chogyal, which is um, Tibetan and Sikkimese for Dharma Raja. Um, this, is the, this is a photo of our late king in white standing in front of the original four seed stone throne built in 1642. Um, and it was the three lamas, as well as our first Chogyal, that really kind of introduced Buddhism to Sikkim. At the time, it was a very, very sparsely inhabited place. Um, fast forwarding quite rapidly. <laughs> this is um, this is in the 18th. This photo was taken recently, but it depicts the ruins of an 18th century uh, capital of Sikkim, and it was during the reign of this ninth Chogyal. Um, where we had a number of invasion attempts from both East and West and experienced a lot of increased British interventionism. Um, the British were very interested in access to Tibet. This was around the end of the Great Game in Central Asia and they wanted to counter perceived Russian influence in Plaza. Um, the capital then moves to Gangtok. And as you can see, the architecture is still heavily influenced by Tibet, um, a region with which the Trogels have maintained very close political, social, and familial ties. And Sikkim was really pulled into modern history by the British, um, their exposure to and the influence of the British administration. And so they participated in the Delhi Dovars of 1911 and 1903 and 1911. Sikkim's 10th Trogel, Sitkyung Tuku, attended Oxford University and spoke Chinese and Hindi and Lepcha and Tibetan and Nepali and Bhutia. And on his way back east, he visited New York and a bunch of other European capitals and places such as Burma and Japan and kept a large format handwritten diary in perfect English with not a single mistake, I kid you not, of his travels replete with photos, playbills, invitations, um, unfortunately, his reign as Trigger was very short-lived, just nine months in 1914, owing to his death in what the British called suspicious circumstances. Um, I think he had probably become too progressive and enacted too many for reforms too enthusiastically for our population. Um, our 11th Trigger, this is now from 1914 to the 1960s, uh, succeeded his half-brother to the throne. Um, he was an avid painter and his reign was characterized by a number of socio-economic reforms. He separated the powers of the executive and the judiciary and he outlawed the use of unpaid labor, a practice initiated by the British, and initiated far-reaching land reform, clipping the powers of local landlords. It was at the outbreak of World War II where he placed the resources of the state in the war efforts of the Allied forces and more than 6,000 Sikkimese, at the time, almost 3% of the population joined the armed forces, including his own son, who died as his plane crash-landed in Peshawar. 
but it was in this reign that India gained independence from Britain and all treaties between the British and Sikkim became void. Sikkim, like Bhutan at the time, were termed special states by a newly independent India and a commission was set up to then determine the nature of their dynamic with uh, newly independent India. And to conclude the historic chapter, this is our late Trigyal, Holden Tondop Namgyal, who was an amateur photographer and radio enthusiast. Um, he received the Order of the British Empire from the UK, the Padma Bhushan, and the Order of the Black Star, from, commander from France. It was under his reign that the Indian army, ordered by New Delhi, drove tanks and artillery up to the palace gates. And Sikkim was effectively annexed by India on April 9th, 1975. So this ended more than 330 years of more or less independent rule. After this, the Trigya was completely isolated, placed under house arrest, forbidden to travel, barred from talking to any press, associates, or even old friends, and was followed and subject to Indian government permissions until his death six years later, at the age of 59, in 1982. So now we're really not that far in the distant past. Around the world, communities and societies have an overarching tendency to root themselves in the past. And this allows them unique markers of identity. It allows them to, to distinguish themselves from others, to legitimize themselves amongst others, and, and provide reference points for their present and their future. It's that idea that unless we know where we're, what we've overcome, it's often difficult to know where we're going. So when communities are stripped of their history, whether by conflict, natural disaster, or just neglect, we lose our foundations and we lose the context that, that grounds us. Our universal human nature, whether we like to admit it or not, is to seek out or create reference points around us that are familiar and help us make some sort of apparent sense out of our surroundings. <coughs> but by now, I hate to say it, those of you in this room know more Sikkim history than 95% of people in Sikkim. Young Sikkimese attend college in Delhi, in Calcutta, and are well aware that their language, dress, customs, societal norms are very different. We remain a state of India, but they face everyday racism, if not worse, and have yet had no access to public records that would root these differences in a history that legitimizes this diversity. So I've been fortunate enough to travel widely, and I've come to realize what a difference there is in the response to indigenous or ethnic populations around the world. And in my own multicultural background, how mutable these concepts of identity can be. Uh, so in working with these archival collections, when I look at Sikkim, I often feel that I'm closer to the past than to the present. And when one really reflects on Sikkim's growth today, repeat with our own widely underreported societal and environmental problems, it's often difficult to imagine where all this can lead. So the, this is basically kind of just provided some context as to um, the value that this archive may be able to bring out for our, particularly for our youth, that's where my interest is. Um, and the impetus to archive, much like the impetus to visually document one's surroundings, in one way stems from this desire to create reference points for ourselves. So probably exactly three years ago, um, wholly unintentionally, as Nayantara alluded to, my background is definitely not in archiving. Um, <laughs> so wholly unintentionally, I saw these seven filing cabinets and these two large Godrej's cabinets being moved into this room. And when I asked what they were, it turns out that they contained documents from the palace office that had lain neglected for 40 years in a garage in Gangtok, and quite possibly would remain neglected for the next 40. So in a moment of sentimentality for my mother's homeland and her memories of it, as well as my own curiosity, I sent an off the, off the cuff preliminary application into the British Library. Um, I had recently read about their Endangered Archives program. So I sent this in and forgot about it until January 2016, when they replied with an invitation to ap apply for a major project grant, which is a 40-page process. I highly recommend it, but it is a long process. 
Um, so convinced by the value of the material it held and the implications it might have on our youth to access their history, particularly primary source material on their history, um, we assembled a team to start counting approximately how many digital images we would be submitting in our final report. And to cut a long story short, in May 2016, we were awarded our grant to catalog and digitize what we're calling the Sikkim Palace Archives. Previously, it didn't have a name, so this is really our name and may be subject to change in the future. Um, we started in September 2016 with a team of five young, excited Sikkimese. We brought on board Dr. Alex Mackay, who is an expert in the British in the Indo Himalayas during the British period, and two technical trainers from the Rojan Mutea Research Library in Chennai. We had a pretty motley crew team that I chose more or less because of their expressed desire to want to give back to Sikkim and want to give back to their community rather than the skills or experience they came with. So it was a very steep learning curve for all of us. Um, but I felt their motivation was, was important considering that we had uh, 100,000 documents to, to work with in one year. Um, and one day after our consultants left, the digitizers and the archivists came to me and announced that they had completed 20 items that day. And I quickly kind of calculated that it would take us 20 years to finish if we continued at that pace. Um, so luckily by February, they were up to 500 a day. Um, which is quite remarkable, actually, when you consider that none of them had ever done anything like this before. So our first step was to determine a cataloging system for the files, which as far as we could tell had not been kept in any particular order. So we've kept the original order for the original files um, and created our own digital cataloging system. And we chose about seven um, categories that range from domestic affairs and foreign affairs to land affairs, correspondence, and so on. Um, and within Within those categories, we have a list of subcategories. We can have domestic affairs, land affairs, domestic affairs, tax and budget, domestic affairs, elections, so on and so forth. And so now, kind of following the British Library's existing cataloging template, we tagged every document with a category, a subcategory, a particular a sequential number within that unit and the number of items and pages contained within that one item. Um, this will help us ensure that the collection is trackable in future, we'll be able to tell if any of the physical documents go missing, and it will ensure that the collection is searchable online. So this is um, Dr. Mackay overseeing the cataloging of files and metadata entry. And over the course of his three trips to Sikkim, he also imparted a series of lectures to the team to help us all kind of understand the value of the material we were working with, which um, was priceless. As I said, we don't have so much Sikkim history available in Sikkim, um, so we need to get it from outside. <laughs> this is um, in the middle of our kind of office, which was actually a disused cow shed that we frantically renovated over the summer of 2016. Um, this is our staging area, and um, this is where a lot of the cleaning, the paginating, and the preparing of files was done. Um, and if I were to quickly run through the very tedious process of, of archiving, um, many of the files come to us looking like this. Some are in much worse state, some are in much better state. This was pretty average. Um, this may look like it's in quite good condition, but considering we are digitizing for preservation and we're digitizing so that international researchers and users can read every little ink mark on this paper, it was important that, that all of these kind of curled, folded edges remain flat during digitization. So what took hours and hours and hours more time than we had anticipated was using these bone folders, which, believe it or not, are technical archival tools, um, to flatten all of these documents before digitization. Um, we had 
a whole range of documents. I would say about 75% were in English, and the rest were in a combination of Nepali, Hindi, Lecture, and Tibetan. Um, you can see some of the tools that we use, which is just a very basic air blower, a mini haberdashery iron bought off Amazon India, and a bone folder. Um, so once digitization was complete, it was handed over to the archiving team on the other side of the room. They were responsible for um, capturing all the metadata. So they would assign each document with a title, a descriptive summary. They would search for dates on every document um, as exact as possible. And then they would tag them with keywords um, in terms of places and people mentioned or specific events so that when this collection goes online, researchers, students, anyone can really kind of search for what they're looking for. Um, here are just a couple before and afters. Um, again, I think this is a lecture manuscript, that's how we received it, and that's what we needed to do to it before bringing it to digitization. Again, another um, before and after. We also had a number of um, irregular sized documents, a lot of architectural drawings of Gangtok. Um, remember, this is the Sikkim Palace archive, so a lot of this does deal with administration, and um, there is a, a few thick files on town planning and land affairs. So a lot of architectural drawings or Tibetan scrolls. Um, this kind of necessitated its own creative setup. And the content very varied. I mean, if you remember back to our 10th trivial, the one who was only there for nine months, he actually secretly got engaged without telling his father, managed to keep it hidden for a year or more to a Burmese princess. And he enlisted the help of the British in this, who made the introduction after showing him a number of photographs of eligible bachelorettes in the region. His criteria were that they should be speak English, be educated, and I think be Buddhist, or come from Buddhist heritage. Um, and he even went to Burma on the guise of pilgrimage um, to, to perform the engagement ceremony. So this is, this is um, his fiancée writing to him, my own dearest Sid, she calls him and um, suggests that his letters are like food to her, which is very romantic. Um, we also have files like this. This is what a lot of the files look like in the front. Um, this is one from the Dalai Lama's enthronement as the 14th Dalai Lama in 1940 in Lhasa. So this file contains a lot of information about um, who should be sent from Sikkim to um, give gifts and what gifts those should be. So there's a couple pages of brainstorming where they decide to send up a silver tea set, a pair of binoculars, some rifles, a writing attaché case, um, some different colored cloth, and, and then someone decides that they should also send up a pair of English ponies, um, which were very difficult to find in 1940s North India. So they, they ended up traveling to Kalimpong and Calcutta and eventually to the Punjab to find these ponies. So the ponies only made it up to Lhasa a year after the enthronement. Um, but the file does end with a nice photograph of these two ponies in the Dalai Lama's stables in Lhasa. Um, we have a number of uh, Tibetan scrolls and with beautiful seals. Unfortunately, um, as we only ha had one year of support, we didn't have the time to um, have all of these translated. So that's uh, something that can be worked on in the future. Um, but basically, most of the folders will look like this when they're put online. So we have our very standard color chart, which gives you an idea of the size. And then every document therein will look something like this. Um, and all of them were rehoused into these four flat pH balance buffered archival folders to protect the edges and everything back in the original collection is as was. So I'm going to just run through a couple slides of the photograph collection. Um, the documents which you just saw 
contains about 100 years of material from 1875 to 1975. Um, and it represents the first primary source collection of local origin that will be made publicly available uh, online for international scholarship as well as for the local community. Um, and it'll be really the first time that researchers will be able to see how um, how historical events that occurred in Sikkim and in the region were perceived by those in Sikkim at the time and how they responded to them both privately and publicly. Um, it's, I don't think anything in this collection has really ever been seen before. So it will really um, breathe new life into a series of engaging stories about the people and um, the land and the complex history at the crossroads of British India and Tibetan Buddhism because there was actually a lot of friction there. Um, the British really wanted the Sikkim Trigal to kind of do what they needed and the Tibetans were similarly breathing down their necks saying, how can you let these British to our doorstep? So it was a very kind of complicated position to be in and one that I imagine those in Nepal might be feeling with India and China at the moment. Um, and in the end, we submitted about 125,000 images to the British Library. So these will be going up online, I'm told, next month. Um, they're revamping their own kind of database system, so it's, it's been delayed a bit. Um, the photograph collection has yet been digitized properly. It hasn't been catalogued. We have no idea of exactly what is there, and we have no way of knowing who has taken what or when. Um, we have about 5,000 prints, we have about 1,300 medium format negatives, about 700 large format negatives, we have a ton of slides and transparencies and 35mm, we've got a couple film reels and um, a handful of glass plate negatives. I would say probably not more than 100 glass plate negatives. Um, many of those are cracked and stuck together. Uh, this is actually a print made in, 19, in the 1970s of one of the glass plate negatives. Um, otherwise, we haven't yet dared to touch them. So this is a, a Sikkimese aristocrat, and we're assuming that someone has just set up a, a studio-like format on a, in a garden in Sikkim. Um, we also have photographs that were definitely not taken by the Sikkimese. These, this is from the Young Husband Expedition. That and the British Expeditionary or Invasion Force that entered Tibet in 1904. Um, so there's a lot of actually pre-1959 Tibet. So for those that are um, Tibetologists or those interested in that part of the world, this is can be quite interesting. Um, in 1955, Archer and his wife undertook a pilgrimage there. So these are some photographs from that trip. Here in this, the horse in the center, you can see our Trivial's wife with her, I think, one-year-old son or something at the time. Um, presumably this is how they used to travel. Um, and I've definitely seen some of these snowsuits available in Tamil. Um, so it hasn't changed that much. Um, these yak skin boats were used to cross the river to Lhasa. Um, and these color, these color images are really, really quite fascinating. There's a, there, there are quite a few boxes of these. We also have photographs um, that are uh, more locally oriented. So this is in Sikkim or on the road to Sikkim, I would imagine from somewhere from uh, Kalimpong maybe. Um, this is probably in the 1930s. We have a lot of photos that might be of ethnographic interest to researchers or anthropologists. Um, these are children in Lepsha dress. We have um, unknown women, apparently, is what this one says. Um, and we have a Newari family. It says unknown, but I think many of us are assuming that these are descendants of Lakshman, Pradhan, Lakshman Das Pradhan, one of the first uh, large uh, Newari to come to Sikkim and almost every Pradhan in Sikkim can trace their lineage back to Lakshman Das Pradhan. So, um, yeah, we're doing a little bit of research on this. We have trading posts in the 1950s, village life in the 1960s, 
Uh, I'm not sure if horses normally lie down to sleep, so I, I'm a little bit worried that this horse is dead, but um, the other two look quite alive. Um, gang talk in the 1960s. We also have a lot of formal as well as very candid photographs of the royal family. This is um, the the one in robes in the center is actually our last Churiel, who was identified as a reincarnate Tuku and derobed when his elder brother died in the plane crash in Peshawar. Well, that's him. Uh, second from the right. So he was about to be deployed to Burma um, on behalf of the RAF, and I think during training, actually, the plane crashed in Peshawar. In 1956, India Jawaharlal Nehru invited the Sikkim Trugail down for a state visit. So here we have our 11th Trugail and his son and the son's wife with Nehru and Appa Pant, the tall one on the right. And we have very candid images too. This is Princess Samya Dikki, who was married to our last trigger. Um He was an amateur photographer, so we are assuming that she's flirting with the camera, or flirting with the cameraman here <laughs> during a picnic. Um, we have a number of images of the Dalai Lama and his uh, visits through Sikkim, as well as our own trigger on a state visit to Japan in 1957. This is, again, our princess candidly looking on as a fish is caught. Presumably this is their dinner en route to Tibet. And we have a number of photographs also much later on in the 1970s. Um, there are a couple of reels of photos like this. This one was actually taken by my, my dad. <laughs> and he first came to Sikkim in 1973. So this is this Indian Central Reserve Police Force as they first started making a more regular presence in Gangto. This is at, this says the Trogiel's funeral procession in 1982, this might be the Crown Prince's funeral procession in 1978. Again, the procession through Gang Talk. If any of you have been to Gang Talk recently, you'll know that this is most definitely not what our landscape looks like now. Um, this is 1982. So actually this photo collection runs a little bit uh, longer than our documentary collection. This is again the funeral. These are uh, Sikhimis from the Limbu community at the palace. Um, and then we have a number of uh, kind of funny images like Nehru with a, a tiger cub. I mean, we have no context for it. Or the Pope with a kada and our crown prince presumably in the Vatican somewhere. And that same prince teaching Vinod Khanna how to ski in Gulmarg. Um, I think somebody did find out that the story here is that Vinod Khanna and his film crew had gone to Gulmarg to shoot their ski scenes until they realized none of them knew how to ski. And our prince just happened to be there. So these newly digitized collections really hold the potential to spark contemplation and dialogue, not just on our past, but on our present and our future, and to inspire revolutions of thought and perception to help our youth, who have so few historical resources, kind of navigate the complex contemporary issues they face today. And this doesn't claim to be the only archive in Sikkim, it's just the first one and the only one that has yet been made publicly available. Um, so if even by releasing this material into the public realm, we can simply encourage young artists and young photographers to engage more with the archive in their work, wherever they're from, um, to help them kind of document the dichotomies and the complexities of their own times, then something good will have come of this. The, the ICP, International Center of Photography in New York, recently had a brilliant exhibition called Archive Fever. Um, which explores the ways in which artists have appropriated and interpreted and reconfigured and integrated kind of archival structures and images in their work. So the hope is that this will start a chain reaction and that in leading by example, other families and communities will also um, 
be willing to release their material into them and, the, and to share their experience and release this into the public sphere. Um, the hope is that this is really just a fag fragment and the tip of the iceberg. So, thank you guys. <laughs> I think someone is joining me on stage. Okay. <laughs> is this on? Um, thank you, Pema, for such a wonderful talk. And um, I think um, um, it's very difficult uh, for me to process all this at once because um, it has such a multi-layered um, resonance uh, for someone like me who's from Darjeeling and um, not long ago Darjeeling was a very integral part of uh, Sikkim um, and I guess um, since you're looking at documents from the 19 1875 right that is the oldest um, uh, document that you've come across yeah more or less that's the oldest one we come across, but interesting that you mentioned Tai Chi because we have a number of copies of documents from the 1830s, oh. um, which is when... <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is when things get difficult for Darjeeling because 1839 is the year that the British officially tricks the Chogyal into parting with Darjeeling and now what's become Darjeeling <laughs> I guess is a reflection of um, a bit, a tiny bit of reflection of what was going on in the 19th century. And um, thank you so much because I guess uh, an archive like this um, in Sikkim um, is something which is um, just which holds such resonance not just for the youth of Sikkim, but I guess. Um, for anybody who's um, had to undergo uh, the colonial experience uh, in the 19th century. Um, so leading on, let's, um, let's ask you a question. Um, I wanted to know that uh, you talked a bit about how um, this not much is known in the public realm about um, what's happened to Sikkim because um, that is a very difficult thing uh, for mainstream India to digest because so many things, I mean so many years have passed since uh, the 1970s and now uh, Sikkim has become this part of um, India where it's, um, it's become this very a vital tourist destination. <laughs> yes. um, uh, a very, uh, it's some, I think Sikkim has, um, was in competition with Darjeeling um, a couple of years ago in being the vital tourist destination. But now, because Sikkim is so clean and Sikkim is so trouble free that it's overtaken Darjeeling and the Darjeeling is... We have very good PR. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> well, I should not discount PR. So, um, can you tell us a bit uh, about the value, the intense value this archive will hold for not just the youth, but um, the older generation who've probably gone through this. Um, through the annexation and um, now it's become more difficult for them to talk about it and in a place uh, once tourism enters then you know it's, it becomes it becomes very difficult to see this place as something that has um, some kind of uh, history which is not that kind of comfortable history. So can you tell us a bit about it? So I think um, really the value of putting private material into the public sphere is, is in the facilitation of scholarship. And um, we are not interpreting any of the material. None of us on the team are 
are writing our debut books about the history of Sikkim. Um, that's really up to other users of the archive. That's up to international scholars, to researchers in Sikkim. And how they interpret the material may be very different based on, on where they've come from or what their perspective is. And that is just something that, the archive is just something that allows um, this variation of, of historical narrative. Um, and so I think from a research perspective, that's very valuable. Um, and the technology involved in the search functions will also make kind of research um, and culling kind of primary source information much more, uh, much easier. Um, and hopefully it will translate into more responsibly written books and articles um, that actually use citation and source, uh, cite their sources. Um, I think regarding the older generation, it has been very difficult for them to talk about. Um, a number of the, the people on the team actually wanted to, to record kind of video and audio record the older generation talking about their memories, where they were at the time of, of um, integration. Um, and, and, um, and what their memories are of that time. And after doing a little bit of a feasibility study, we, we realized that while so many were, were actually happy to be asked these questions and we're happy to see that young people were interested in their lived history that when they realized that we wanted them to talk on film or on the records they said well I would have to change this and I wouldn't want to say it like that um, so that project got put on hold and as I was researching for for this talk, I came across this idea of post-memory. Um, and I'm just gonna have to get a little help in explaining it. Um, a critical theorist called Marianne Hirsch uh, defines it as being post-memory, as being distinguished from memory by generational distance. So it's marked by a deep personal connection and imaginative investment but its application can be broadened to a much more general audience. Um, and I think, hang on, I've lost, I've lost the rest of that um, description. But um, what it means is that people in generations who haven't actually experienced quote unquote traumatic events feel as though they have. And they have these memories that they feel as though they're living also. So I think as people become more and more comfortable talking about this period of Sikkim's history, really the, the 70s, I would say, is, is the difficult part for people to talk about. But as more and more people start talking about it, hopefully it will become easier and more cathartic for, for those who lived it. Um, okay, so do I have time to ask her one more question? No, it is answering. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> hmm. So I wanted to ask you. Um, let's see. <sighs> the thing that is um, something that is most fascinating about uh, the integration program of the Indian state has been this um, um, this culture of silence. Everything was done in a very hushed manner, and um, slowly. And we uh, mentioned how um, the state has decided to put a stamp. Very, very. Um, it hasn't been um, something that is very conventional. You know that you go through conflict and you see a lot of um, bloodshed and you see a lot of, um, you know dead um, statistics. None of that. When it comes to seeking, it has been a very, it's been done in a very hushed manner. So my question is that um, um, at the beginning of the talk, you said that um, the archive is generally perceived to be a very boring place. And But um, let's talk about how 
the archive can also be a very dangerous place. Because <laughs> it's so, it's, it's such a creative, it can be so creative. Yes. And um, among the various registers, one register of an archive is that, um, it's kind of like a ticking bomb waiting to explode. <laughs> what are your thoughts on, on that? You've asked me a very difficult question and one that I'm going to be try to be as diplomatic as possible in answering. Um, yes, I think oftentimes the archive does have the possibility and the potential to dig up alternative versions of history. And um, again, that's not something that we are interpreting, but... Um, um, but um, the collection that we were working with over the course of that one year was a independently held private collection. It's a collection that I would assume the Indian government had enough time to, to take ownership of, had they wanted, and, and yet they didn't. Um, it's a collection that has been in private hands albeit forgotten, but in private hands for 40 years. Um, a number of, I think, the classification laws in India restrict material for about 20 to 30 years. Material can be um, classified. Uh, we're, we've just passed 40 years, so I think we're well within that, within that well outside that limit or that boundary. Um, and. Uh, Many of the people who authored the documents, who received the documents, who uh, commented on the documents have long since passed away. So um, hopefully this uh, makes the archive an interesting place to learn about, um, I guess Trump would call them alternative facts, um, but uh, one that's no longer perceived as dangerous. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> for the sake of your archives. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to open the floor and we're going to take some questions. Okay, people, come on, come on, come on. Do you, don't you want to ask any questions to our, to our lovely, lovely, lovely presenter today? Okay. Right, so the grant was one year. It's finished. Uh, we had a we. So I I started a small um, let's say organization in Sikkim around the same time. So that was kind of the auspices under which this was all conducted. It's called Project Androm, and it really um, was trying to facilitate scholarship and to redefine our relationship with our communities, our cultures, and our landscapes. Um, Unfortunately, we've run into a little bit of uh, administrative hurdles. Um, given that Sikkim is a protected area of Sikkim, and I am, I am not an Indian citizen. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we're still running a few projects, but it's much more uh, under the radar, let's say. Um, we're doing things quietly. We have people working on the digitization of the photo collection. We haven't um, made an application for a grant under Project Andro for that, but it's something that is kind of running along slowly as and when we can. Um, it is something that I think we're going to start looking into, kind of, particularly with the photos, because there is a lot there, and um, particularly with the digitization of negatives, it requires, I mean, as maybe I should talk to the Nepal Picture Library. <laughs> but it does require a lot more equipment than we have in the city. Any more questions? We have an 
had a lot of time to chat about um, you know experiences sharing. So we've also done this very DIY guerrilla style um, archiving um, project where often we felt very ill-equipped um, technically, um, but at the same time, you know, I think there is. So we haven't had a lot of chance to talk simply because right. of time limits. Perhaps we could spend five minutes doing that now. Yeah. But um, I think there is this potential of a lot of cross collaboration, you know, um, especially because um, there is a, a, you know, we are interested in this diasporic sort of identity um, of being a Bali, and about mm -hmm. the library extends itself beyond just the border, current border of the Bali as well. Um, and, and this time it's particularly exciting, it's very, really exciting to have Augustia on board. Um, the Feminist Memory Project, just the fact that, you know, she, um, language, you know, just ne the Nepali language, I think, um, has made just the research work so much more, obviously, in depth and engaged, and everybody's falling in love with Augusta uh, in Kathmandu. Um, and also, very uh, interestingly, we have five young photographers from Kalimpong, Daisin, and Sikkim, uh, who are here to uh, be a part of the festival, um, help us run the festival, etc. So there are these collaborations brewing already. A team was in uh, Kalimpong. Um, these guys, Praveen, everyone here, runs a project uh, in Kalimpong um, and a space too now, which is also a cafe and a cultural space. But I think there are all these potential collaborations, and so um, this is not so much a question, I guess, but just the beginning of hopefully a conversation yeah. um, that we can initiate and ideas we can cross with about projects and shared histories as well. Because I too have family in Sikkim, you know, and, and, and we know that you So there is this incredible um, shared history that we have. I, I, I think, I mean, one of, one of the things I admire most about what you guys are doing at the Nepal Picture Library um, is the the curation and the research around the archival collection, and that's something that um, that we haven't yet gotten around to in Sikkim. You know, I, I I feel like we're just at the stage where people are like, okay, so here's a lot of documents and a lot of photographs. Okay, yeah, they're just old. You know, but we don't have anyone yet who's kind of really going through them and creating any sort of um, either historical or creative hypothesis in a way that can then be presented in an exhibition. Um, Augustaya was explaining to me a little bit about the Feminist Memory Project when we first met, and what I found really interesting was not that it was geared around um, grouping together just more images of women as subjects of the camera, but that the kind of boundaries of the project were being dictated by the women's memories. And like I said, I was explaining that um, what they found in their research is that women tend to memorialize more. Um, so these are kind of sorts of uh, research paths and insights that, I mean, I think would be great for, for some sort of collaboration. And maybe you can come work on our archive. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be on point early on. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have a few minutes if we do have a question. Hi, uh, uh, thank you very much, Jenna, for um, the fascinating uh, presentation about something that is apparently boring. And uh, <laughs> thank you to also Augusta for uh, keeping the tempo alive. Uh, with, with comments that uh, was equally as as humorously harmless to humorous as it was very important. Um, <clears throat> my, I don't know to what extent my questions will be relevant, uh, given that on, on the one hand it is a, it is an archive, uh, but it's coming from someone who has no experience or training in the field, but will potentially be involved in a sort of project. Uh, the context is that we might be involved in uh, doing a project about archiving and memory making in, one, in some of the settlements in the Kathmandu Valley, 
by working collaboratively with some of the local residents, mm -hmm. by forming a co-curating team first. Mm -hmm. uh, and the objective is to go around collecting artifacts and objects uh, that mm -hmm. is supposed to represent ordinary histories and stories and values. Um, <clears throat> and then to be able to uh, do some kind of traveling exhibition in other um, districts and villages in Nepal that have been equally um, devastated by the earthquake and that may have lost histories and stories uh, in similar ways that servants in the city have. Now my question is, um, how does one arrive at a point where one gets to decide where the one is? It could be a committee of body that certain objects and artifacts have some kind of value uh, <coughs> that uh, may then uh, push one to decide that these objects and artifacts are archived and versus others that may uh, that may not inherently represent value uh, just enough to be archived. A. Um, B. Um, what are some of the uh, what could this what could some of the potential platforms be for a project of this nature? I don't do it in the project uh, is clear to you in your head, but what are some of the potential uh, platforms be in a, in order to exhibit these kinds of uh, artifacts and materials uh, in places and societies that may not have uh, any history uh, in their cultural life? Of um, you know of having the spaces where one, one can go and you know point that out just an artifact and talk about history and stories and and such. Um, uh, I guess those are my questions. I don't know; they're quite muddled because the idea is muddled in my head. <laughs> um, well, I think it sounds, from what I understand, a fascinating project to be working on or to be starting. Um, I think it's always difficult when you're talking about uh, quote unquote ordinary histories to know where to draw the line between what is uh, worth being archived or worth being included. Um, generally, when you have a kind of a, a more institutional archive, it actually sparks a dialogue um, because an institutionally held archive is really just the archive of that of that one perspective, let's say, you know. And this is when you get um, uh, memory projects and kind of ordinary family albums being offered up into the public sphere. These really serve as counter studies. So I think one one thing to look at might be maybe what already exists in the public realm about those communities or about the neighborhoods in which you're working um, to see what else can be added. And when you take, I think, individual artifacts or family albums and you put them then into the public sphere, they do take on a lot more meaning. So looking at how viewers and um, the audience whoever, I mean, I don't know who you have in mind, but how they will be able to react to those. I think also giving, the, giving your subjects, you know, a certain kind of parameter in which to choose what they want to present as being valuable to them or as being reflective of their history is also important. Um, in terms of uh, traveling the exhibition, I, you know, this is something I've often thought about in Sikkim, is how can we travel these exhibitions around to the more remote parts and villages of Sikkim. Um, I haven't come up with a good, or I ha we haven't implemented anything yet, um, but I, if you're familiar with Dayanita Singh, the, photo the Indian photographer, she does these great kind of traveling installations of her photographs. Um, where she mounts them kind of on boxes and slides the photos in and out of them so that you can create an exhibition kind of anywhere. And she's moved on now to kind of this museum book that just kind of unfolds and unfolds and unfolds for, for meters and meters. Um, with 3D objects, 
with tangible objects, um, if that's what you're thinking about, I, I'm not so sure. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. You've answered it already, Lynn. We have time for one quick last question, if there is one. Otherwise, we're good to go, I think. Thank you both, Fema, Alessia, and Alessia.